I've been doing corporate finance for 25 years. Um, I've raised money for three of my own businesses, but I've also raised money for uh, lots of other businesses. Lots of people come to me and they think, oh, it must be really hard. It involves accountants. I've got to know all about profit and loss and cash flows. Um, the other thing as well is because a lot of people that come to me, they do it wrong. Um, investors tell me that typically they, of a hundred business plans they get, they might invest in one. Um, if you do it right, I mean, I would say over the 25 years, I've probably averaging more like one in two. Um, and mostly it's not that I'm particularly brilliant at it, it's because the, the 99 people that don't raise money themselves, it's because they do it the wrong way. Number of things they get wrong, number of misconceptions. So first of all, if I'm talking to my bank, so I'm a customer of HSBC, I've been a customer of HSBC since I was 17, um, I want to get a loan from them. So um, I go on to the bank manager, I'm his customer. Um, my friends say to me, oh, you should, shouldn't just go with HSBC, you should shop around, get the best rates. The government's telling me it's all the bank's fault, they should be lending to me. So am I buying or am I selling? We are selling. Basically, the bank manager doesn't have to give us the money. There's plenty of other people after the same amount of money that he's got. He's got, okay, he might make money by lending to us, but he also might lose money if he gets it wrong. So, doing the research. Mostly the research actually in this case is about us. Are we actually fit? to raise money? Are we ready for it? What stage are we at? Because that would determine what sort of money we can go for. Um, how much do we actually need? Again, that would determine who we talk to. And what do we need it for? So what stage? What have we got? I would say you should only really be talking to somebody about raising money if you've got a good idea. Certainly not if you've got a bad idea. So sometimes if you've got no idea, you can get something. <laughs> In terms of where we are, that determines the sorts of money we should go for. So if we're very early in the process, we've literally got an idea, we think we, we could get a business off the ground, a complete stranger is not going to touch you. They're not going to, they don't know you from Adam, why would they give you any money? So the starting point tends to be things like friends and family, talk to your mum. If your mum won't back you, then who will? Um, you can get some startup grants and loans, people like p and &E, Entrust will do those sorts of things. Um, but you're very early in the process, you're not going to raise as much money, you just want a bit of seed just to get you going. Um, then you're into building some sort of prototype or beta or something like that. Um, there are various funds that will help you along that way. Um, some of them are sort of loans, some of them are grants. Then you get to the point where you launch, you're, you're almost ready to launch the product. Um, you haven't actually sold any yet, so you, but you still need a bit of money just to get you that final, final stretch. So maybe you've, you've made it and now you want to do some marketing. A bank's not gonna touch you. For that there's no nothing there that says that you can repay a loan so you're going to be talking typically some sort of equity investment once you get beyond revenue you can start talking to banks they might actually listen to you then because they can see that you might pay some of it back um, or you might still still be down the equity route uh, and then once you're profitable who cares <laughs> in terms of how much um, you've got to be realistic in terms of the, pro the stage you're at, that determines how much you can get. I, I was reading a, um, a thing about Instagram um, the other day, and they started out with a small seed round, then they did a slightly bigger um, second round, then they did about half a million for the third round, and then they sold out for a billion. So that's the sort of stage you tend to go through. You, you're not going to get 100 million off the bat. What do we need it for? 
basically it breaks down into two types. If there's something physical you're going to buy, then you can give somebody security over that asset. So if you can't pay the loan back, they can go and take the asset off you. So I think if you, if you go to DFS, you can get financed to buy a sofa, because if you don't pay, they'll take the sofa off you. If you're doing things like marketing or product development, what is there at the end? Um, even if it's a website, it's of no value to anybody else. So a bank's not gonna lend you money just for marketing or prototyping or that sort of thing. So having worked out what we need, what type of uh, money we need, we can then break it down in terms of who are the, the customers in this situation, the investors or the lenders that we're going to talk to. So as we said, we could start with friends and family. Biggest test of all, I would say, if, you, if you're not happy taking a friend's money with the risk that you could actually lose it and maybe lose the friendship, then that's a big test of whether you think it, really do think it's a good idea in the first place. But then there's other people, strangers, that we could go to. Um, first off, business angels. Biggest problem with angels is they don't exactly go around shouting out who they are. You don't see adverts saying, I've got loads of money, come and talk to me. Um, most of them are very secretive. They work through accountants and lawyers who, who manage the money for them. Um, so you've got to try and find them. Um, Tends to be as well, certainly in the northeast, there's not as many as there are in London and the southeast. Um, so it's a lot harder. Um, what do they want? Angel investors, some very, very rich people will just give you some money and say, let me know how you get, how you get on. A lot of them want to get involved. Some of them basically are buying themselves a job. So you've got to have that personal chemistry. You've got to be happy that they, they're going to be involved in your business. One of the things on Dragon's Den you'll find sometimes if there's two, two or three of the, the investors arguing over an investment, the guy, the, the investee that's pitching will go with the, the angel that knows something about their business, knows something about their sector. Um, and I'll say, how do you find them? Typically, you would tend to have to work through some sort of intermediary, so talk to accountants and lawyers and that sort of thing. <clears throat> it is hard, and we'll come on later, you've got to be careful because there are legal implications of talking to them as well. Crowdfunding started as a, a way of people getting money, effectively donations, to do things like make an album or put on an art exhibition or save a building or that sort of thing. So it was very much um, about philanthropy. It was charity sector type stuff. And the idea was you put something on the internet and said, we're trying to raise 25 grand for a minibus. Please give us some money. And people would donate. It's like, almost like a just giving type thing. What happened is it's been taken over by investors and venture capitalists so, and companies. So what people started doing is saying, I'm starting a business. Do you want to give me some money? Um, if they're just giving you money, that's absolutely fine. There's no, no comeback. There's a, that's, and some people, what they'll do is they'll say, you will get the first release of the product or you'll get a gold-plated one or whatever, whatever it is. Biggest challenge you've got with it is the way it tends to work is you have to post a video. Um, so you've immediately got to tell the world your idea. <laughs> so it doesn't always work for, for a lot of businesses. Government funds. The great thing about a lot of government funds is it's free, free money. Um, so it should always, wherever possible, try and get a grant because um, you're not having to borrow or sell any equity. Um, at a national level, if you're doing an innovative business, you should look at the Technology Strategy Board. They, they tend to drive a lot of the, the grant funding. And they go for themes and that sort of thing. My experience of Technology Strategy Board is good if it fits with your, what you're trying to do because they tend to work on big programs and they try and engage you with universities and they also um, like doing competitions. So it tends to drag the whole thing out. So if you're happy that you might not be able to start until October, then fine. But if you want to start next week, that's probably not going to be the thing for you. Um, at a local level, there's various 
um, startup loan schemes, um, and there's various support grants you can get. Grant funding, um, there's a whole raft of people in the Northeast that you can talk to. Um, so obviously you can come here to the Business IP Centre, you can talk to Science City, um, you can talk to Sunderland Software City, um, I didn't put it on, there's Digital City in Teesside, um, MBSL in Northumberland, the BIC, RTC, Design Network North, Growth Accelerators, lots of them. Mostly, um, they're all working on the same basis of ERDF European funding. So typically, they will fund up to 40, 50%. The only criteria that they all have is you have to be based in the Northeast and you have to be a, a small or medium sized business. We've now got VC funds. Um, so we've got, they split into local, national, and international. Again, with that is the more local you are, the small amounts of money that they have available. Obviously when you're getting up to the international ones, they're the ones that are putting half a million into Facebook or, or the next Google or that, that sort of thing. Um, the national ones, we struggle um, in the Northeast because they tend to be um, basically they're in London, Cambridge, and maybe a few in Edinburgh. Um, the only national fund we have in the Northeast is NVM, but they only do big deals. Um, how they work, um, so you need to understand where they're coming from. A VC fund typically um, will either be uh, a perpetual fund, so it just runs on forever, um, but most of them are time limited. So they might be a 10 year fund. Um, and that's important for us when we're trying to raise money from them because we need to know where they are in that 10 year period. Because by the end of 10 years, they have to turn all of the money that they've invested back into cash to give back to their investors. If we're very early stage, it might take us seven, eight years to achieve an exit. So what that tends to mean is if you've got a 10 year fund, you're only going to do early stage for the first two or three years and then you'll stop doing it. So if you're talking, if you're in an early stage in your business and you're talking to a VC and it's year seven of their fund, there's no way they're going to give you any money. Um, so that's where it comes down to back to identifying your customers. Um, some of them try and specialize. They can't all be good at everything. So you might get funds where they only do life sciences, um, very specialist area. You might get funds that only do digital, um, you might get funds that only do renewable, that sort of thing. Um, and then stage focus. So regardless of the time period, some funds won't do any startups at all. Um, some funds will only do startups um, and they're, they're then on to like a perpetual fund. Typically, if I'm going to raise money for somebody, I'll talk to four or five investors, that's it. Because if they won't do it, then nobody will. In terms of local VC funds, I don't know if anybody's had any dealings with them, but they're the ones that do um, equity, early stage type investments. So North Star, um, they do the proof of concept fund and then follow on that with the accelerator fund. Rivers Capital is an angel matching fund. So if you've got an angel investor, they can put some more money in alongside it. IP Group, as the name implies, they tend to like patents and intellectual property, that sort of thing, do a lot of technology type deals. And as I said, NVM is a local fund, but they're a national in reality. They happen to be, um, they started, it's NVM is Northern Venture Managers, they started in Newcastle. If we're going to raise money somewhere along the way, we're going to have to put a value on what we are selling, um, very much an art, not, not a science. Um, you know, how can you possibly value your business when you're pre-revenue, when you've got no track record at all? Um, but the basic rule is the more risky the investment is, the lower the valuation is going to be. Because if I'm an investor, I want more share of the equity to give me more chance of making a, a big upside to compensate for the risk. And the risk we have is in that is you get to the point where if the valuation is very low, you could potentially lose control of your business. 
And that, but that comes down to it. People, if you're worried about that, it's either it's the old 50% of something, it may be better than 100% of nothing. Um, but if you think the valuation is too low, then you're raising the money at the wrong time or you're raising the wrong type of money. You should be looking for a grant first or a startup loan or something like that. Um, once we get more mature, we can talk to lenders. Lenders are always their number one priority is they're looking for security. They want you to be certain that they're going to get you to pay the money back. And if you can't, they get something for it. So, so you tend to be a more mature business. The exception to that is I, I got a bank loan for a startup, um, the last business I did, but that was a franchise. So it was a proven model. So all I was doing was setting up the Newcastle version of it. The two in the middle, NEL, Growth Fund and Finance Wales, Growth Fund, they're public funds, but they still work on the same, same basis. They're basically stepping in as the, if the banks won't talk to you, but they should. So they're sort of filling that market failure, if you like. And the Regional Growth Fund isn't a, len a loan as such, but it's for big projects. So you typically it's something like a £200,000 project and they'll put 50000 in. So having identified what we want and who we're likely to get it from, we need to give them some information. We need to write a proposal. So this is our, if you like, our marketing collateral that we would normally do if we were doing the product. So we might send them a brochure or send them a flyer or have a website, that sort of thing. In terms of raising money, we're going to do a thing called a business plan. The idea of the business plan is to get our thoughts all together in one place. Um, as part of the numbering, num number crunching bit, we will work out how much we need maybe with a bit of contingency, um, and when we need it. So we do, we'll do a month by month cash flow. Um, but the business plan only really has one purpose, and that's to get us in front of investors. The, the way they all work is the first time you contact them, you say, I've got this great idea, I'd like to come and see you, oh, can you send me a business plan? So that's what you have to do. Who is it aimed at? So we're getting back to our Dragon's Den lot again. What we're doing is we're talking to professional investors and what are called high net worth individuals. High net worth individual is defined as somebody, if I remember rightly, they've got to have free cash of over £200,000 um, to invest and know what they're doing. What you would typically do, what I would do is if, if somebody says, oh, I know somebody who can invest, I would get in touch with them. If they are a genuine investor, they will be quite happy to sign a form there's a standard wording you can get one off the internet that says I hereby declare I am a high net worth individual and I know what I'm doing so that basically gives you your your get out if you send it to anybody else you're actually technically you're breaking the law so a prospectus if you've ever read one they make pretty turgid reading it's all about negatives it's all about protecting people from investing and losing their money so there's all sorts of health warnings risks you mustn't say this you mustn't say that but we're not doing that, we're doing the business plan. We're selling, um, we're selling an opportunity. So we're all about focusing on the upside. We've got to sell the dream um, and how the investors that we're talking to are going to make loads of money out of it. That's what they want to hear. So what's in the business plan? Specifically a business plan to raise money. So again, sales document, but now we're selling the company rather than a product. So we're selling the overall business. Um, we need to tell them how we got to where we are, where we're up to. We need to tell them where we're going, paint them that vision of where, where we see it. We will need a set of numbers. They'll ask for, for projections and numbers, so you might need some help with that. And basically, at the end of it, we're after some money. So we should ask. So it's a request for they need to know how much we want. Um, and we need to show they're going to make some money out of it. How do I judge yours against somebody else's? Um, is it worth taking the risk to make that return? Um, am I likely to make the return? So in terms of the return, we've got to show them, are we a global business? Are we a national business? Are we just going to be a little local business? Because again, that will determine who we're talking to. 
we're going to set up, so I'm setting up a training company in Newcastle. It's a franchise, so I'm limited to the Newcastle area. No point in talking to a VC in California. So I would talk to a local bank for something like that. If I'm talking to a VC in California, they want to see that we're going to go massive. Um, they'll want to know how we're going to take on America, how we're going to be, how we're going to beat Facebook, how we're going to beat Google, that sort of thing. Um, what's the likelihood of that happening? Um, doesn't have to be. I mean, I, I've done investments where the chance of success is pretty low, but if you do succeed, the return is massive. And that's some, some investors like that as a, you know, it's a more of a punt type thing. And certainly that's the, the Silicon Valley model. They all hope they're going to make the next Facebook or the next Google. And most of them don't. Um, but if you've got the chance that you might, that sometimes that can be good enough. Um, biggest problem they have is they need to see how they're going to get it back into cash. Because if they put money into you, if, if they're lending the money to you, then that's fine because you're paying it back month by month. If they put it in as equity, then at some point they've got to find somebody else to buy the equity off them, or you've got to float on the stock market. Um, so they've got to work out whether that's going to happen in their sort of time frame as well. Uh, now we need to go and do it. So basically what we need to do now is we've thought about this, the, the need, if you like, that the investors have um, or the, the lenders have, that they need to see a big return and they need to understand the risks involved. So we now need to explain all of that to them. So here's a generic format which I use for a business plan. Um, you can, occasionally I might change the order slightly, but it pretty much flows in that order. Um, so six, how many seconds? Two, four, six, eight sections. Um, and it's the same, every business is exactly the same. So this is our opportunity to sell the vision. Um, what you've got to do is focus on the potential market size. Um, but what you've got to do is be clear on what your market really is. This is again a lot, one of the problems that people do is they think, well, we're a, we're a travel company. So our market is the whole of the travel industry. Um, and what you've got to do is do as much research as you can. So again, use the Business and IP Centre to use the databases for Mintel and things like that. Um, use your own market research. You know, ask people, this sort of thing. I had a guy, he did a survey, he's a cyclist, so he, he did a survey for the members of his cycle club. So as I said, the key thing that people get wrong is they don't know what their market really is. Um, what investors want to do is they want to back winners. Um, so they don't want an, an also ran. So what they want is a statement like, we will be the leader in the luxury cruises for consumers age 50 plus. So it's a clearly defined subset of the overall market. People used to say, uh, they used to do financials and they say, I'm going to end up with 1% of the market. 1% 1, 1 you die at some point because you haven't got any critical mass. Um, competition. Chances are we're small, competition's going to be big. Um, not a problem. Um, everybody does have com competitors. I, I hate it when I, people come to me and the, the business plan says, we are totally unique, we don't have any competition anywhere in the world. Um, because there's two things with that. One is uh, competition is good. It's very expensive to try and create a market on your own. First technology company I raised money for, we licensed to uh, our product to a Korean company who it was the first one of the first ever tablet computers but this was way back in the early 90s and there was no internet so it didn't really do much and there was a lot of hype in the market um, this Korean company saw the hype bought into it thought we're going to miss out on this great market opportunity so they licensed our product from us and everybody else pulled away from the market and left them on their own they had no marketing budget, no brand name or anything. They sold seven. So not, not 700, not 777, <laughs> worldwide. Um, it's very expensive to create a market on your own. Um, so you want competitors to share some of that burden. Used to be that they would always ask for five years forecast. 
I think most investors have now realised that you can't see ahead five minutes, never mind five years. So the years four and five are always total fiction. So I do three years, but I do it by month because what you're, you're doing is you're looking for things like, in terms of the cash flow, what's the minimum point you're going to reach? Because typically what's going to happen is you're going, you're, the whole point of raising the money is because you need it because you're going to spend it. So you're going to raise £100,000. That's then going to be dribbled out over the next 18 months. And hopefully at some point, the cash will start coming back in and then the cash flow will go, go back up again. Things tend to run late for one reason or another. Um, they don't take off at the rate you thought. Uh, or maybe they take on faster than you thought. What you need to look at, what are the metrics? What, what are the key things that are going to change the model? In terms of the investment then, who are our current shareholders? Um, who's got shares, who's got options? We need to identify the funding required. So we need to be upfront in terms of, um, so we're looking for half a million, gives them a, a framework of, okay, right, that's the sort of scale that this business is a, a, about. I would say in the, in the first time that you're talking to them, this is gonna be the first contact with them you don't put any valuation in it's a bit like like never was saying you don't name the price straight away um, that's way down the line when you can when they're actually seriously interested and in you're going through the negotiations because it's also it's not just about the valuation there's all sorts of other issues about what your salary is going to be what your terms and conditions are um, there might be a variation depending on if you sell for this, they get so much. If you sell for a bit more, they get a different figure. That sort of There's all sorts of things you can, you can do to change the, the deal. So you don't need to get into that at this stage. And they need to see that they're going to get their money back some way. Um, is it likely to float? Most businesses don't float. Most businesses are bought by somebody else. And that's where the competitors come in. Again, in an ideal world, you've got some big competitors with deep pockets. So there is, I'm sure there's a lots of companies in California where their business model is just to be bought by somebody else. And so we'll do it for a couple of years, we don't need to sell anything and then we get bought. And then as we said, key point about the business plan is its sole purpose is to get some meeting, get in front of them so we can do a pitch. So we've got to tell them who to contact. Um, and that should typically be you. It's not your advisor. Um, it's you. That you're, you're in charge of the project of, get, of getting in front of them. And then once you get in front of them, basically your pitch to them should basically follow the same idea again. So it's the same thing. What you're doing then is you're giving them an opportunity where now they've, hopefully they've read it. They possibly haven't. They may have only read the executive summary. They've said, yeah, this looks interesting. Come see me. And then you can take them through it again and give them the opportunity to ask questions. So contact details, usual thing, phone and email. Key thing is call to action. You are requesting a meeting. It's not just here's a business plan, what do you think? It's here's a business plan, when can I come and see you? Um, use the phone. Lots of people will say, oh, I, I emailed the plan out to 40 odd investors, didn't hear anything. Well, of course you didn't, it's sat in their inbox somewhere. I ring them up, say, so, um, I, I'll do it as I've, I've got this great client. I think you, you should take a look at it. I'm going to send you a plan. Send them a plan, follow up the next day. Do you get the plan? Have you had a chance to look at it? Yes. When do you think you'll have a chance? When can we put something in the diary? You've got to be proactive, get in front of them. Um, there might be other documents available. So you might have things like patent applications. You might have a more detailed explanation of how it works. You might have... Um, loads of spreadsheets and things. I mean, I, I've sent out plans in the past um, where I haven't actually put any numbers in because I've, I've sent it to somebody and said, look, have a look at this, what do you think? I haven't done the numbers yet, but is this something you might be interested in? 